Hi, it's thermal imaging camera review time again. This time around, I have a Unity UT690B on the workbench. Again, Banggood provided me this unit for review, and I will provide the product link in the video description below. And be sure to check it out if you are interested after watching this video. A few months back, I reviewed a Unity UTI 85A on this channel, although that was an entry-level thermal imager and only had a thermal resolution of 80 by 60 I was quite impressed with the performance of the unit, and it was actually a very useful thermal camera for electronics work. Now, the UTI 690B is a little bit of an oddball here, in my opinion. If you search it on Unity's website, you will not find this model number at all. After doing some research, it appeared though the 690B is actually the same model as the 260B. I can confirm this via the firmware version, which I will show you in just a little bit. So if this is the case, this would be the highest spec model in the new series of the thermal imagers in Unity's product lineup. Basically, the UTI 85A is the lowest spec model and the 260B, and of course in this case, the 690B, is the highest spec model. As you can see here, these two models side by side, they look pretty much identical in appearance, except of course for the labels on these units. And of course the front end, you can see that because they're using different imaging sensors and also the 690B has a visible spectrum camera. The layout is ever so slightly different, but uh, the two units actually looks pretty much identical here. Specwise, the 690B boasts a UFPA or uncooled focal plane arrays detector with a resolution of 256 by 192, which should be sufficient for most applications. The refresh rate is spec'd at 25 Hz, which is definitely fast enough. Of course, we will have to see it in action a little bit later. Depending on where you buy it, you can expect to pay between $300 to $400 at the moment. Although it sounds like a lot of money, this is actually really inexpensive when compared to similar spec brand name thermal imagers. For instance, the FLIR E6 with similar thermal resolution would cost you close to $2,000. The 690B also has a visible spectrum camera built in, and it can display the superimposed IR and visible spectrum images, and we will see that shortly as well. Another important parameter of a thermal imager is the thermal sensitivity, or NETD, the noise equivalent temperature difference. It basically tells you what is the smallest temperature difference can be distinguished by the imaging sensor. For the UTI 690B, it is at 60 millikelvin, which means it can detect a 0.06 degree temperature difference. This is three times better than the 150 millikelvin figure we saw in the UTI 85A I reviewed a while ago. So this means that, in theory, the thermal images produced by this thermal imager should be much sharper and less noisy. With the background information aside, let's power it up and see how well it works. It looks like it's going to take some time for it to boot up. By the way, this is one of the main drawbacks of these standalone devices. Because of the limited processing power available on board, it won't be as snappy as your smartphone, which typically has much beefier processors. But if you recall that the UTI 85A we reviewed a while ago, that one booted up almost instantaneously, so I don't know why this one takes significantly longer to boot up. What I'm going to do, I think, is to go through a couple of items and uh, you can see this camera in action. And later on, we will take a detailed look at all the manual items so that we can understand the full capability of this thermal camera. The first one I want to show you is this Arduino board that I have powered on for a while. And you can clearly see all the components where they heat it up and uh, that shows up on the camera relatively clearly. Now, the one thing I played around with this camera I noticed is actually you cannot get too close to the board as the image would not be in focus. If you recall that when we did the same experiment with the i85A, you can actually get pretty darn close to the board. So in that sense, although the thermal resolution for this camera is much higher than that of the i85A, the actual resolution 
you can get from the image is quite comparable because you can't get that close to the board. Now that said, this is actually preferable because sometimes you do want to identify the items from afar and you don't want to have to move your camera across the board and figure out what is the culprit that is causing the problem. And especially sometimes you don't have the ability for you to get that close to the object you are observing. So the higher the resolution, the better it is as you can actually look at the surface from afar and uh, being able to identify the problem. So from that perspective, I think this camera is definitely very, very well suited for troubleshooting electronics problems. As you can see here, the components are clearly visible on the board. And uh, the next one I want to show you is a switching power supply. Uh, let me just move that into the view here. You need to be careful here as it is plugged in right now. So that's the switching power supply. And as I drag the thermal camera across the surface here, you can see the components behind and you can clearly identify which ones are hotter, which ones are cooler. And the resolution is just about right for you to be able to tell each components from this distance. So that's clearly an advantage of using a thermal camera of higher resolution versus the one that we had with i85a. In that case, you would have to get really close to be able to have this level of resolution. So this is definitely a great thermal camera for troubleshooting your circuits here. If you take a look, the image actually does not move as smoothly as I would have liked, given that it's specced at 25 frames per second. I definitely think this is probably not as fast as 25 frames per second. Maybe it is, it's just there's a little bit of a lagging behind when you are dragging the camera across the surface here. And I'm not sure if you can hear, but once in a while you do hear that clicking sound, that's actually the thermal sensor is being calibrated and is fairly normal for these kind of uh, IR sensors needing calibration once in a while. And of course, you can get a rough idea of the temperature of each of the components in that crosshair in the middle. Of course, we can configure this thermal camera, which I'll show you just in a little bit, of uh, measuring different spots of the temperatures. Now, that temperature reading may not be that accurate right now because in order to get accurate temperature readings, you will need to know the emissivity of the material you are measuring. And uh, emissivity, by the way, is defined as the ratio of the energy radiated from a material surface to that radiated from a black body at the same temperature and wavelength and the same viewing conditions. So for a black body, the emissivity is by definition one, and for everything else, the emissivity would be less than one. So that's how the thermal temperature is determined by these thermal cameras. And as a classic demonstration, let me put my hand on the workbench here and you will see the thermal image left behind. So that's my hand. And uh, let me put it just for a few seconds. And now if I remove my hand, you will see that's the thermal image of my hand. So that's very, very cool here. Now let's walk through the menu system. As I mentioned earlier, the 690B and i85A are of the same series, so we expect the menus to be very similar, as we'll find out here. So by pressing set, you see this main menu here, and uh, by press set again, you will be able to expand each of the menu items here. So for the measurement, we have center spot, high low, and uh, the region of interest. Now the region of interest is essentially, if you select that, you will basically only measure the temperatures within that selected region, which is actually very useful if you try to concentrate on a smaller area on the thermal image. And the other ones, of course, are also useful. By default, you are reading the center spot, but there's no cursor there. This tells you exactly what you are measuring here. Now, the high-low here is also useful. As you can tell you, the highest and lowest temperature in that view here. Of course, you can combine some of these together, but sometimes you get very busy very quickly. So my preferred way to do the measurement is just leave out the unnecessary cursors and leave it simple. So that's the measurement. 
And the next on to the palette. For the palette, it is totally depends on personal preference. My favorite is still this iron spectrum here. And you can see that this is relatively clean and uh, easy to understand. Of course, you can get fancier and by going to the rainbow. And, uh, you know, it's not my favorite, but uh, you might like it. Depends on your taste. Of course, we can have this white hot. Essentially, this is just a grayscale image of the thermal spectrum here. Now, move on to red hot. Again, you know, these are up to your personal taste. This one essentially is inverted the grayscale spectrum we saw earlier. And we have a few more lava. And uh, the last one is really kind of busy, in my opinion. So, definitely not my favorite. Again, my favorite is the iron, the default spectrum here. So now let's move on to a few different functionalities we have on this camera here. The point temperature, again, you can assign multiple points on the screen. So you can do one, two, three, and that is useful when you are doing measurements here. That's the image mode. This is actually unique to the 690B because we have two cameras. One is the IR camera, the other one is the visual spectrum camera here. So by default, it's a thermal image, but you can select to obviously a digital camera. So this is just like your phone camera and there's nothing special here. But what is special is you can actually combine these two views together. So for instance, right now you can see there is a thermal image superimposed with the actual visible spectrum image. Now this can be handy when you are trying to identify the object at the same time identify the temperature but i find it a little bit of a hard to use because as you move around and you can see that the refresh rate is not that great and also the two are not really aligned and uh, actually will be aligned if you are at the right distance but uh, it's very hard to dynamically adjust the alignment while you are doing measurement so the next one we have is this uh, picture in picture. You can kind of have the view of uh, where you are from the optical image, and then you can concentrate on the thermal image in the middle. So that could be helpful. So now we'll move on to the settings. So this is where we can kind of find out what exactly the model number is. So let me first uh, get there and you will see that's the system settings, device information, and you see here, we clearly set UTI 260B. So that's actually the model number recorded on the firmware, even though this uh, unit it says is 690B. So that's how I determined that this indeed is in the same series as the UTI 85A because of this model number here. So everything else you can see that is fairly standard. Now, the one thing I wanted to point out is this uh, measurement is that by default the emissivity is set to 0 0.95 as i mentioned earlier in order for you to measure the temperature very accurately you have to know the emissivity of the material you are trying to measure but for general use you can just leave it as 0 0.95 just realizing that the temperature is not as accurate as it could be Another important part is that ambient temperature, this helps you to do the calibration of the device. And that's also important, but of course, most of the time, you just leave it as a temperature that approximately what your room temperature is. The next parameter is the distance. So unfortunately, the minimum distance you can set is 0.25. So as you can see that I cannot go any lower, but I also can move it up if I desire. So that's kind of uh, the settings here on the measurement. And if we go back, there's a USB mode. Ah, so this is one part I wanted to mention too. Unfortunately, this thermal imager, you cannot record video on this uh, device by itself. But of course, you can always connect to your PC and using the PC software to record thermal camera videos. So I assume that's what the USB camera option is for. And the other things you probably don't need as much. But one thing I do want to point out is that temperature scale. So if you read the specifications here, this one is capable of measuring from 5 Fahrenheit all the way up to 1000 Fahrenheit. But it's done so in different uh, stages. What I mean by that is if you look at the thermal temperature scale here, 
you essentially have a high gain and low gain setting. So low gain is actually suitable for measuring wider temperature range, whereas high gain is only suitable for measuring a smaller temperature differential. So the downside of this is switching between these two is actually painfully slow. So now, for example, I just switched to low gain, and you see that it takes forever to switch between the high gain and the low gain mode. And this could be a deal breaker for some people constantly needs to measure two different uh, thermal resolutions for different temperature ranges. But nevertheless, to me, that probably doesn't matter much as most of the time I'm just going to use the high gain anyway. So let's uh, go back to see what I mean by this uh, high gain, low gain. So you can see that image becomes a little bit dull because we're essentially measuring a much wider temperature range. And uh, I will probably put a few pictures of measuring hot objects using this uh, camera on the video here so you can see what that uh, high gain looks like. But anyway, so that's one of the drawbacks I see in this camera is the switching mode is the switching time between the high gain and low gain takes very, very long time to complete. Now, that's also because probably the onboard processor, the processing power is not as adequate as you would find in a smartphone in that instance. So that's again, the drawback we know of these kind of handheld devices. And uh, unfortunately, that's just something you have to deal with. But that, as I said before, most of the time, you probably won't need to do that. That pretty much wraps up the video, and here's my verdict. I think the 690B is a rather capable infrared imager, despite some deficiencies, for instance, the slow boot up, the mode changing time, and the onboard video recording functionality is not there. The overall performance is quite decent, especially for the price you pay. It is certainly geared towards the middle and upper market segment, where higher thermal resolution is required. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel so you can see more videos like this in the future. I will catch up with you next time.